Okay, well, we have a full agenda today. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get things started. Um, and we'll start off our webinar with Kirsten Verklas from NASIO, who will start us off. Great, thank you so much, Kara. Hi everyone, my name is Kirsten Verklas. I'm with the National Association of State Energy Officials. And I'm really pleased to be joined by my colleagues from the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, NARUC. Uh, for this first webinar of the DER Integration Compensation Initiative. Um, we had a few webinars before, so this isn't the first one, but we are very pleased to kick off a new curriculum um, with this webinar. Um, this webinar will look at the aggregated DER grid services. Um, next slide, please. And before we get into um, the, the agenda of today, we just wanted to level set you all and talk a little bit about where this initiative has started and what why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I want to also thank the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity, for their support and all of you for attending today. So I don't think uh, it's anything new um, when I talk about the problem statement, but what Neo Ganazio really want to do um, with this um, initiative is look at how the current and anticipated growth of DRs or distributed energy resources and the introduction of aggregated DRs into wholesale markets as the result of order 2222 is fundamentally changing the way that the grid is planned and operated. And our members, the state energy offices and the public utility commissions are really having to increasingly need to evaluate, consider and establish the rules and requirements as well as enabling policies and programs to bring these resources online safely and fairly to provide retail and wholesale services. So these new myriad um, technical and economic issues will require a lot of new information and tools for our members to make informed decisions related to the connection, technical operation, and compensation of aggregated DRs, all in the distribution, bulk power system, and the wholesale energy markets. So we're really hoping that this initiative provides these tools and information to the state energy offices and public utility commissions as they consider aggregated DRs and their impact on the energy system. And with that, I will turn it over to Danielle from NIRUC. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, it's always a pleasure to partner with NASIO in various activities. And we're so grateful to have RMI providing support to our members through this particular initiative. The DER Integration and Compensation Initiative was started in 2022, uh, as Kirsten said, with both our, our organizations to really help our state members understand the impact of their decision making related to the connection, the operation, and the compensation of aggregated DERs as a reaction to or response to for quarter 2222, but also lots of other <laughs> customer, utility, and state activities happening uh, outside of RTO regions with just the proliferation of distributed energy resources and opportunities that go along with those. So it's our intent through this initiative to make sure that both NARUC and NASIO members are informed about what the potential impacts of their decisions might be when it comes to aggregated DERs to elevate the different risks and opportunities of different decision paths and bring a variety of perspectives to the table to help with making decisions in their very important roles at the state level on the distribution grid and also in some cases across the entire electricity system. Our initiative is, uh, is led in part by an advisory group of 10 New York Gymnasium members from across different regions, both inside and outside of RTOs. And we're gonna put in the chat um, a reference to a webpage that includes past recordings of webinars, resources, and other activities where you can also find the opportunity to register for future webinars. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Kara as our MC today, who's gonna to lead us through the rest of the program. Excellent, thank you so much, Danielle and Kirsten. Um, hi all, Kara Goldenberg with RMI. I'm a principal on RMI's carbon-free electricity team. And me and my team have the opportunity to work with Nehruk and Nazio on um, the 2023 and 2024 curriculum under the DER Integration and Compensation Initiative. And so I wanted to provide a bit of a preview of what we have in store over the next eight months or so. Um, we've designed the curriculum around three sequential modules. We have this first module, which we're kicking off today, and we're so glad to, that you are with us um, to be there for that. <clears throat> but this first module is gonna be focusing on the, the modern landscape 
And the objective of this module <clears throat> is really to share lessons learned and best practices of what's going on today across states in terms of utilizing aggregated DERs and integrating them into policy and regulatory frameworks. <clears throat> We envision that this first module is really going to provide a foundation for participants on which different topics will grow from and will learn from each other as we proceed through the following modules. The second module, um, what we're calling hot topics, will give us an opportunity to explore cutting edge applications. And so these are timely opportunities that we're seeing emerge today that really provide an opportunity to unlock the full potential of aggregated DERs. Topics that we plan to cover in the second module include interconnection, integrated distribution planning, and new opportunities for federal funding. And the third module will give us an opportunity to really dive deeper on a particular topic through intentional collaboration. We'll be able to determine the topic that we focus on through the conversations and the questions that we see emerge um, over the, the duration of the first two modules. So with, that, <clears throat> with these three modules, we plan to engage participants in a number of different ways. Um, this first module will focus mostly on um, webinars and, and providing some education and sharing of experiences and case studies. The next two modules will provide opportunities for more interactive collaboration and engagement and group problem solving. <clears throat> so as I said, this first module is comprised of three webinars. You are on our first webinar today, so thank you for joining. Um, <clears throat> and as we said, we're gonna be focusing on aggregated DER services. Um, <clears throat> and we're joined by an all-star lineup um, our moderator today is uh, Chair Marissa Gillette from Connecticut, Pura. Um, we have an expert with us, Paul Martini from Newport Consulting, who will be providing an, uh, an overview of the landscape of DER grid services. And then we also have two panelists joining us today, <clears throat> Lynn Huckabee from the Massachusetts Department of Energy uh, Resources and Vince Farty from Google Nest. And uh, our second webinar will take place December 18th. Excuse me, I'm just gonna get this frog in my throat. Okay, thank you, that's much better. So our second webinar is gonna be focusing on evaluating DER grid services. And that's gonna take place Monday, December 18th at the same time, three to 4.30 Eastern. And um, we've been able to finalize our panelists for that webinar. We'll be joined by uh, California Energy Commission, Commissioner um, Andrew McAllister, as well as Samir Sakar from ICF, Natalie Mims Frick from LBNL, and um, Sandra Sweet from the New York DPS. We're looking forward to that and encourage you to sign up. And then our third webinar will take place Monday, January 8th and we'll focus on the options for aggregated D for compensating aggregated DER grid services. So with that, um, the objective of today's webinar is, is to establish a baseline understanding, as I said, of the grid services aggregated DERs can provide beyond individual systems. And so in service of this objective, we have the following agenda planned. Um, after my, my remarks, I'll, I'll pass it on to Chair Marissa Gillette, who will introduce our first speaker, um, expert Paul Martini, who will provide a 20-minute presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. We'll then move on to our two panelists, Lynn Huckabee and Vince Vardy from Google Next and the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, who will provide 10-minute remarks before we move on to our Q&A session. We'll have a full 30 minutes for Q&A. The first part will be moderated by Chair Gillette with some questions that she's prepared for us today. And then we'll move on to get Q&A or to get questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A option um, on your Zoom to send us Q&A during the presentations you won't be able to see other participants' questions, but we will be able to monitor them as they come in. 
and we'll then um, be able to use those for that portion of the Q&A session, as well as for the Q&A session after Paul Martini's presentation. Um, <clears throat> thank you, and yeah, then we'll end our day with closing remarks. And so thank you again for your participation with us today. Please just send us uh, any requests if you can't see anything or read anything, and we are looking forward to the conversation. And with that, I'll turn it to Chair Marissa Gillette. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to Nazio and uh, Nehruk for um, putting on these educational webinars and for inviting me to moderate today. Uh, myself and my colleagues here at Connecticut are uh, quite interested in this subject matter. Um, for those who um, may not know, um, before coming to Connecticut, I spent some time at the Energy Storage Association and was there when FERC ordered 2222 or two by four, whatever you might call it, um, was there when that first came out. So this has been kind of an interesting uh, evolution to see uh, how it's dealt with um, uh, on all sides of uh, the regulatory sphere. Um, so I'm really personally excited uh, to hear the presentations today and to benefit from these experts and um, their responses to uh, our questions. Uh, and first up, we're going to have, as Kara mentioned, um, Paul Demartini, who is a managing partner at Newport Consulting. Uh, importantly, he currently uh, leads DOE's operational coordination project and has previously co-led DOE's modern distribution grid initiative. Uh, he's authored a number of um, papers and frameworks that I know that I'm familiar with, and you probably are as well. Uh, um, a lot of work um, for various uh, national laboratories and um, public utility commissions across the country. So I know that we all are going to benefit from uh, this presentation. And as Kara mentioned, we will have time for um, a little bit of Q&A after uh, Paul's presentation, um, but much more time uh, later on. So any clarifying Q&A that crops up, um, happy to take after Paul's presentation and um, really looking forward to it. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Next slide, please. So, you know, as we think about grid services, we clearly are expanding well beyond what we may have thought about uh, some time ago when we started looking at DER providing services largely into wholesale markets uh, starting really 20 plus years ago. And um, that has expanded both at the consumer and, you know, customers and communities at the edge um, around lower cost alternative energy supplies, uh, you know, my own solar uh, rooftop, uh, for example, uh, electricity reliability resilience, as we've seen with um, battery storage um, backup at, at premises. And of course, as we think about, um, you know, what's needed for EV integration and resource, we, we know that there are constraints, uh, including my own house, where um, I was limited to how much solar I could put on because of the service transformer uh, that, that's constrained up the street. So. We know that there are um, opportunities at the edge um, on the distribution system by extension. We know that there are grid reliability and resilience considerations. Uh, obviously, capacity constraints are starting to emerge beyond those that we've sort of worked on for the last decade around hosting capacity, integrating uh, rooftop solar, for example, uh, and also power quality dimensions that we've been addressing for the last decade. Um, in the bulk power system, uh, resource adequacy and reliability continue to be uh, considerations, uh, system resilience has taken a lot of prominence over the last uh, several years. And of course, there's a lot of discussion going on around balancing variable supply and un unpredictable uh, net load uh, in many of the more recent um, ISO and, and NERC reports that have come out. And actually a FERC um, order that was issued, a uh, ruling that was issued just a month ago. Um, in the appendix to this deck that you all have um, is a long list of, of various services um, that I recommend you take a look at. These are definitions that uh, 26 altogether, uh, 17 wholesale, uh, five distribution, and four at the edge. Um, they are compiled as a result of uh, taking a look at all the uh, various ISOs and, and FERC and NERC. Uh, regulations in terms of definition and service definitions that are embodied in various tariffs. Uh, at the distribution level, these um, these definitions are compiled from looking at what several states have already implemented um, uh, over the last uh, decade. And at the edge, we're seeing uh, many of these services start to pop up uh, into uh, uh, microgrid service uh, uh, agreements and the like. 
So we try to compile uh, a fairly comprehensive list uh, for you to take a look at. These are complementary to the uh, North American Energy Standards Board's uh, uh, development of uh, standards around definitions. Uh, so think of these as an extension of that and something to take a look at. And I'll come back to why that's important in, in a moment. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we'll be talking about, I'm sure, through this whole series uh, and today is the, the need to scale up uh, the use of distributed energy resources and the aggregation of those resources as, as um, helping to support the overall needs of the system and mitigating some of the some of the effects of the integration of these resources as we try to uh, optimize the system as a whole to address affordability and equity for all customers. Um, certainly reliability and resilience um, issues are, are continuing to be uh, a primary focus in many states and, and locales. And this is also uh, driving the need for greater opportunities to think about how DER may be used. Um, certainly things like microgrids and other aggregations uh, can be used to help mitigate these needs and, and certainly an area that's a particular focus these days. Next slide, please. The other we're seeing um, and discussions occurring in various places around the U.S., maybe not uh, entirely across the U.S. yet, but certainly in, in, in quite a few uh, locales, the discussion about the potential growth, uh, load growth that is unmitigated uh, that could occur on the distribution system uh, could be as high as uh, almost 40%, you know, over the next decade or so. And it's clearly the discussion is going on about how do we, how do we reduce that by by managing the load, by managing the, the charging, maybe by managing other exports of energy into the distribution that could offset the load such that we can maintain the, you know, within the existing operating uh, parameters, uh, existing operating envelope, if you will, on the distribution system to mitigate some of the distribution uh, costs that might otherwise uh, occur if we took sort of a traditional approach. So clearly an area that's, that's a focus in, in quite a few locales. Next slide, please. The other uh, area, obviously, uh, touched on uh, at the outset is um, certainly at the bulk power system, we're seeing uh, greater needs and opportunities for flexible resources. And, and prominent in that is looking at how flexible load management, but not just flexible load management as we've uh, sort of been thinking about it and, and further developing that over the past decade or so, but rather uh, with FERC 2022, the opportunity to have aggregated supply uh, into the wholesale market is, is coming to be a reality over the next um, decade uh, as, as implementation occurs. So we're gonna see a fairly dynamic and interesting mix of resources to meet the objectives that we, that we have for clean energy resources and, and also an opportunity and the scale that's needed for, uh, for meeting this need for flexibility uh, is gonna dramatically increase one estimate that I've seen from National Lab and, and from uh, from Brattle uh, suggested maybe three to four times the scale of uh, distributed resources that we have now providing services that we would need over the next decade or so. So a significant increase is going to be needed. So a lot of my presentation today is going to be focused on how do we, what are the kinds of things that we need to think about to scale um, the kind of uh, capabilities that, that we know are possible. Next slide, please. So um, this just is a chart that I helped put together for the liftoff report that some of you may have seen the, the VP liftoff report. And this helps illustrate the path we've been on for, for quite some time with respect to distributed resources of various types and how that has evolved over the last 20 years in terms of providing increasingly more services and the types of services. One of the things I would highlight in the cadence and in the green is that we're moving into a more dynamic use of of distributed resources and the aggregation of those resources uh, to more from away from where we were doing sort of limited peak shaving into more seasonal dispatch that's more frequent. And then as we get further into addressing some of the needs that are identified in the wholesale market and clearly a distribution uh, with electrification, we're going to be looking at more daily and continuous dispatch of, of, of uh, distributed resources as part of uh, providing the mix. So the nature of how we will use these services will change as well, uh, in addition to the scope and the scale that are required as we move forward into the, into the next decade. Next slide, please. 
But we do know that, you know, this is going to happen uniquely across the U.S. So not everybody's going to be at the same, you know, have the same needs in terms of how far we advance uh, the capabilities, um, whether we're talking about institutional practices or procedures or business processes and, and engineering practices or technical standards. But but there are some foundational elements that span this, no matter where you are on this journey, uh, as we think about small utilities or larger medium size or, or the largest size utilities uh, in various locales around the U.S., uh, we there are some foundational elements to kind of think about uh, to set the stage for uh, being able to scale as as appropriate within your within your area. Next slide, please. So what I want to tee up next for uh, the discussion is to to think about a couple of things. Um, these aren't all inclusive, but these are a few areas that I think that might be helpful to, to talk about uh, as you proceed in these various modules. One is um, we know that it's important to align specific grid service performance requirements with the needs. So uh, certainly the technologies, what the service offering is, um, those need to align with specific grid service performance requirements, whether wholesale or distribution or, or even at the edge. And the other is um, there's requirements that the customers, because in many cases we're talking about bring your own device uh, type programs or aggregations of customer resources and the customer would have bought or uh, bought those resources for their particular needs, not necessarily for providing grid services. So there's going to be requirements that you know all parties need to have to uh, to uh, to resolve and, and and reconcile and align before we can really um, leverage these resources for how they might be best used. This also creates you know um, there are requirements that have an overlap. Uh, overlapping uh, requirements, and so that can create constraints on what an aggregation can provide, where the, you know, particularly as we think about providing multiple services of the 26 uh, or that are listed in the in the appendix here. Um, not all of them can be provided uh, at the same time, or there may be constraints that prevent, you know, one being provided uh, by another. So these this is something that needs to be thought through and understood and and um, and and uh, and worked out. There's also, you know, effective performance risk management um, and, and risk allocation. This isn't always discussed, but it's really important. Uh, some grid services, uh, for example, distribution capacity avoidance requires very reliable performance. Otherwise, you might end up not being able to avoid the, the distribution upgrade and, and, in fact, have to build it. So, you know, obviously, we need to make sure that the services are, are reliable. Many times that um, in the contracts that are let, uh, for these services, say non-wires alternatives, performance assurance uh, requirements are pretty pretty stringent and, and can be quite onerous, actually. So liquidated damages, letters of credit, et cetera, can really create uneconomic financial burdens on DER aggregators. So one of the things to think about as you pursue the scaling of these um, kinds of services is what, what kind of performance assurance may be required? What's reasonable to think about in terms of risk allocation between what the distribution operator with a DR aggregator and so on uh, need to consider in terms of meeting overall objectives from a policy standpoint. The other thing I'll point out is, um, we don't often talk about this as well, is what's a viable business model and how, what are the considerations that we should discuss in terms of ensuring that there's um, that there is a viable business model. We often focus on, and obviously there's further discussion in this, um, uh, this set of work uh, modules around compensation, which is clearly important, but equally important is the cost of doing business. And I'm going to touch on a few of those things in the, in the coming slides. Thanks. Next slide, please. So one of the things we need to consider as we move forward and start to scale up is that um, we're going to need to think about DER aggregate, uh, sorry, orchestration. That is, how do we manage the various types of uh, aggregations of various types of technologies that have different capabilities and the various services? How do we think about coordination of all that? Obviously, that's a topic that you you all are going to discuss in subsequent uh, webinars. And obviously, there's um, there's good work that's going on that we can uh, help contribute to that as part of the DOE work that's ongoing. Um, next slide, please. One of the things as we think about distribution in terms of coordination and orchestration is that we have in the past sort of thought about distribution and managing it 
maybe at the substation level as represented on the left side of this uh, graphic, uh, or maybe at the whole feeder level, which is kind of the main line running down the middle of the graphic. But in reality, when we think about having to manage um, constraints on the distribution system, particularly as we start to see uh, electrification, is that we're gonna have to manage the constraints all the way to the service transformer uh, and the secondary side of the distribution system, in some cases, service drops to their individual premise, uh, like at my house. So this becomes a lot more complex question to address than what's at the substation or circuit breaker or you know the feeder, but rather there's all these other nodes that probably uh, will need to be thought about and, and evaluated. We all talk about you know multi-directional or bi-directional power flow. But one of the things that's really unique as we move forward um, and for planning purposes and then thinking about how we compensate is that the constraints in each of these particular nodes as I'm sort of highlighted in the, in the graphic uh, can be quite different. The time at which the constraint happens can be quite different between say uh, one of these nodes, say a 3A that's listed there in the upper uh, in the kind of in the center or a 4B, which is down uh, sort of in the center there to a section to the, to the right. Um, each of those can happen at different times of the day. Uh, have one may be injecting power into the network and adding uh, significant load. The flow may, the power flow may flow from from that node to the upper node. Uh, may not all go all the way to the circuit breaker. So this gets a lot more nuanced and complicated as we move forward. It's I illustrate this only in that as we move forward, we're going to need to think about. Uh, compensation models, orchestration models that really reflect the fact that there's going to have a lot of variability as we get out uh, into the system. And so how do we uh, think about the right approaches to address this? Next slide, please. This also is a very complex diagram, and I'm not going to go through a lot of de detail here um, today, but suffice it to say that we have many ways in terms of um, animating uh, distributed resources and the aggregation of those resources. We can use signaling either through a centralized approach or decentralized. We have various uh, methods for determining value, which we all are gonna discuss on subsequent meetings. We can have dispatch signals or controls. We can have price signals. We can do that price signals through various tariffs programs. We have procurement me methods, um, forward auctions. We can have real time. All of these can flow through to whether directly to an end device or through an aggregator or maybe an aggregator to a manufacturer to the device. So there's a lot of ways that this can work. We also increasingly are talking about autonomous ways, sort of the lower uh, set of uh, threads. And that can be done through a fixed parametric like what's happening with uh, IEEE 1547-2018, uh, some of the, some of the uh, automated um, uh, measures that are in there. Uh, or it can be done through a dynamic approach um, where the device itself senses uh, changes in the system and responds accordingly. So there's, a, again, whether that goes directly to the device or through the submitter uh, intermediary uh, in terms of how things work um, or, you know, the manufacturer. So there's a lot of different ways this is going to evolve. Um, and again, I only share this just because as we go forward, I think we need to think about the nuances as um, as we move forward in terms of how this orchestration will need to be uh, considered. Next slide, please. So one of the things going to you know cost um, uh, aspects uh, for aggregations is the fact that we have a lot of non-standardized uh, rules and practices, and that uh, across the U.S., uh, particularly in the distribution and retail side. Uh, certainly, FERC Order 2022 is trying to address standardization at the wholesale side uh, in many ways. Uh, and obviously, you know, given some of the feedback that FERC has recently given over the last month, uh, or actually in October, uh, to the ISOs, they're trying to really enforce kind of a standard approach at the wholesale in terms of how DER will be able to, aggregations will be able to uh, participate. But at the retail level, we really kind of have a checkerboard of unique institutional, business, and technical rules and requirements. And that creates costs um, for DER aggregators when we think about scaling up uh, on a national basis, uh, recognizing there are going to be you know, unique aspects to each state. But uh, there is a need to kind of really start to think about that. Um, in the DOE's VPP liftoff report, they highlighted a number of areas that 
uh, that really get at this issue of trying to standardize uh, some aspects. And I'll get into a couple of those, but fundamentally there is an opportunity to adopt a key set of standard practices and technical standards that can facilitate aggregation of DER uh, opportunities and, and still allow each, uh, each locale uh, an ability to chart their own individual pathway uh, as, as, uh, as appropriate. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're working on is development of a maturity model, uh, thinking about uh, how we think about what the practices and procedures and technical uh, you know, standards that may be necessary to really facilitate you know, scale uh, development and, and utilization of aggregated distributed resources. You know, nationally, you might, might look at this and say, well, you know, we're kind of at this early stage where between sort of level one and level two, we've got some repeatable processes, some places, but, but they're not really standardized. Um, in some cases, we kind of have individual uh, pra uh, practices that are developed maybe by a utility or, or, or the like um, within a state. And so we don't have consistency from one utility to the next. And that creates scale issues. Um, as we move forward, particularly with FERC 2022 and some of the requirements in the ISO RTO markets, um, we will need to necessarily start moving up into a standardized um, uh, level in terms of sophistication and, and maturity of, of processes and, and practices. Uh, in some cases, we you know, are going to need to get to level four where we'll really measure and control uh, Next slide, please. This is this slide. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but we are developing as part of the Department of Energy's uh, work on operational coordination. We are going to be developing a pathways document. We've already developed uh, a grid codes document that really starts to discuss uh, the kinds of capabilities that would be needed uh, at various levels and for different levels of uh, DER adoption and the like. Uh, and I'll, I'll pause on this for a moment. Uh, uh, we'll come back to that another time, but um, I just wanted to quickly introduce that this is work that's ongoing and and uh, we'll have more to, to share in the coming months next year. Next slide, please. So um, as some takeaways uh, for today, um, as was mentioned at the outset, integrated system planning is really important element, uh, thinking about how we uh, incorporate and, and utilize uh, aggregated distributed resources. Um, and, you know, that starts with, you know, technology neutral system needs assessment in the planning process. Uh, in, explicitly including opportunities for DER services to address, uh, excuse me, address identified needs. Um, we also really need to include community engagement because in many cases, communities are really driving a lot of what's happening with distributed resources increasingly as they look to address their sustainability and resiliency objectives. Uh, we also need to think about distribution open access. Um, FERC 2022 um, has um, provided some opportunities for states to uh, have a role around governance and oversight. Uh, and as part of that, we've been looking at the question of, you know, expanding the opportunities around distribution open access that mirror some of the things in, at the wholesale level. One of which is a distribution standard of conduct that would mirror uh, the transmission standard of conduct that nearly every utility has signed on to around the country. Um, and adoption of a standard DER services agreement. We have a paper out uh, that proposes that, and we're starting to engage uh, the National Association of uh, Energy Standard Board uh, to uh, uh, North American Energy Standard Board, I should say, around the development of an actual pro forma agreement uh, that, that could be used and adopted. Uh, standardized distribution of grids, uh, services definitions, which are provided, uh, and then some common state level uh, for 2022 market and operational coordination platform. This is something we'll be um, developing a, a paper on and, and have available in, in the coming months. Uh, customer engagement is also really important. One of the things that we learned uh, in talking with some folks around the world um, is the, uh, and looking into this further, as we scale up, we're gonna need to get to, a, you know, really kind of the main street of customers that haven't yet or previously participated in programs or tariffs uh, or you know, providing any services from their from their devices. So as we as we scale up, we need to really think about customer behavioral factors uh, that go into the design of retail tariffs programs and procurements. 
Also, a lesson learned from the UK, uh, which um, has recently adopted an aggregator code of conduct um, for large commercial, but also developing for small commercial and residential consumer participation. Because as we move into particularly small commercial and residential customer participation for services that are more continuous and daily, it'll be really important for both those customers to really understand what they're signing up for, and getting their buy-in and sustaining that over time. Uh, so that we can get the full value out of the potential resources that they have. Next slide, please. So um, you can't, you probably can't read all this here, but um, in the slides that you have, um, these are the, these are six papers that we've recently re released, and they're going to be posted on the DOE website uh, later this month, and we'll be sure to share that with. Uh, Kirsten and, and Danielle uh, and the team to uh, to be able to provide to you all. Uh, but these papers, the customer uh, consumer resource flexibility is the paper on uh, consumer behavioral considerations, uh, the distribution and grid edge services definitions, those are the ones that are in the appendix here in this deck. Uh, the standard distribution services contract is the paper that provides an outline of what a performer contract would uh, include uh, between a utility and a DR aggregator. Aggregator Code of Conduct is one that we developed based on uh, the, the UK model of uh, FlexAssure, HomeFlex, uh, uh, voluntary um, codes of conduct that they've developed and the industry developed in, in the UK. Uh, the Distribution Standard of Conduct is an adaptation of the transmission uh, standard of conduct for, in this, in this case, would apply for distribution uh, operations at a utility to provide um, non-discriminatory um, uh, operation of, of uh, distribution services and, and particularly in, in light of FERC 2022 requirements and the uh, distribution grid code requirements build, or framework builds on that uh, uh, maturity model that I was sharing earlier in the pathways. Thank you. All right, Paul, and uh, I think for those wondering, um, the slide deck will be shared. So you know, many of us will wanna take a closer look at that. Um, in the interim, I think we have time for um, a couple of questions, and if we don't get to them, we'll hold them for the the later um, the later Q and A. But uh, I got some folks wondering um, about data sharing arrangements and whether those might be necessarily necessary um, or a necessary prerequisite to optimally uh, aggregating the DERs. And there's a suggestion about a data hub, and I know um, something we're certainly exploring in Connecticut. So, um, Paul, any thoughts on that question? Open, you're on mute, sir. Sorry about that. Um, yes, information is critically important uh, to to make all this work. And um, if there isn't already going to be a discussion about information and the types of information that we needed as part of this series, I would encourage it. Um, one of the things we are developing as part of this um, proposal for what a shared um, coordination platform is. Uh, at the heart of it is an information sharing, uh, not just around, uh, you know, say a DER registry, which uh, some folks maybe are, have already been exploring, and other consumer to um, uh, aggregator uh, information sharing that, that a Green Button Connect uh, can provide, but rather also the operational and market information that would be necessary for an aggregator to, to really be most effective. So, uh, and, and as well as the operations, both the bulk, uh, bulk power system and, and distribution. And I think you're gonna, you'll see in the FERC um, uh, and the implementation plans that are being proposed by the ISOs and RTOs, information is sort of at the heart of uh, a lot of this to make sure it'll work. Thank you. And then um, switching gears a, a little bit into a planning uh, question, um, and this questioner has, uh, makes a point about Hawaii that I was not aware. So in every uh, vertically integrated states, except Hawaii, apparently, um, distribution and resource plans are filed separately. So uh, kind of a broad open-ended question about um, any recommendations that you might have for regulators like me um, on how we can integrate, well, it wouldn't be me because my utilities are not vertically integrated, but regulators sitting similarly to me on how to better integrate um, planning processes. I mean, it's very important. Uh, and that's right. I mean, Hawaii is probably the only one, and I had the benefit of working with uh, Hawaiian electric utilities for the last six years on, on 
kind of integrated the plan and putting that together. But um, the work that uh, Nehru Canazio, this team has been doing for about four or five years now, and I've been had the benefit of working with Lisa Schwartz and Julia Homer at LBNL and PNNL um, respectively on integrated system planning and um, uh, Danielle and Kirsten had, had led some this comprehensive system planning effort a couple of years ago that had a lot of good insights coming out of it. Uh, and there's a number of papers that have been developed over the last, um, really the last two, two years on kind of the current, you know, practices, best practices in, in regards to that. So um, I suggest maybe following up with, with Kirsten and, and Danielle on um, kind of the current um, work on that. Excellent. Uh, so I think maybe one more question before we have to move on here. And it's one I'm interested in as we're trying to launch a uh, non-wires alternatives um, framework process in, in Connecticut. And uh, I think the question is about um, projected distribution costs uh, that, that you kind of walk through. And uh, that leads a lot of us to think, well, how can we accelerate deployment of NWA? So um, any thoughts you have on that and particular barriers or challenges that uh, we might still need to overcome? Well, I think um, I think one of the challenges is um, it, one of the biggest challenges that is used in the procurement model uh, for that. I, I think the, the procurement model hasn't really worked because the, the revenue potential, the risk allocation issues that I kind of tied, uh, highlighted haven't really worked very well. Um, you know that, so I think kind of under, under clearly understand the needs and what the value proposition is. I think the value that is of the avoided cost or the deferred cost, I think we're needing to move into avoided cost from just deferred cost. And most NWAs over the last decade, when we started this about six, seven years ago, were really around deferral. But when we look at that number, it's not about deferral, it's about moving to avoidance. That is, how do we avoid that capital uh, permanently? So I think we need to shift the our focused on what it is we're trying to solve for, and then what methods are, are best to engage um, aggregated DER to be able to address that, recognizing that the, what may be required as part of the performance there. So I would kind of start fresh and look at what was done over the last six years, because what was done for the last six years was largely around deferral. It hasn't really worked very well for the utilities or the aggregators. Um, uh, or even, you know, obviously from a policy standpoint, how we haven't achieved the, what was uh, anticipated. So I think there's an opportunity to kind of take a fresh look at defining the problem and then looking at what the answers are that might help um, address the scale that's needed uh, and, and really kind of think through that. And I think there's a role for programs, a big part for programs in there, in addition to tariffs that may be applied. And there, I know there's some recent papers that that LBNL, Lisa Schwartz, and some colleagues have looked at there. But I would also look at programs as uh, many DER aggregators are also trying to figure out, um, you know, a, a, maybe the programs are a more effective way to think about risk allocation between who does what and, and how to cost effectively be able to provide the service that's necessary, uh, in addition to what might be done through a procurement or Appreciate that. Definitely a um, different lens for um, regulators and policymakers to look at that through. Well, um, I think we need to move on in our presentations, uh, but uh, we did have a couple more questions come in, including someone interested in discussing the distinction between wholesale markets and retail programs. Um, so uh, I think uh, Lynn, who's one of our next presenters, is going to tackle that a little bit. So. Um, for now, we're going to um, uh, thank Paul and um, move on in our presentation um, to our panelists, uh, Lynn and Vince, um, who, as Karen mentioned earlier, um, Lynn is from the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, and Vince is with Google Nest. Um, so uh, I believe Lynn's going to be up first, and um, as her presentation will um, uh, will make clear to you, um, she's got a lot of experience in energy efficiency and DR. Um, and particularly advocating for them in uh, regulatory proceedings through um, uh, dockets like at MassDP, I imagine, similar to Connecticut Pura. Um, so in Lynn's presentation, I think she's going to talk about connected, connected solutions um, and uh, how that's been um, hailed as a success um, 
uh, and uh, look forward to Lynn's presentation before we transition over to uh, Vince, who is going to be talking about what Google Nest has done um, in terms of trying to increase access to in compensation for grid services um, like uh, Google Nest thermostats um, through their rush hour rewards programs. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lynn and uh, just remind folks that they can um, let it rip with questions in the Q&A section uh, that we will get to um, during our healthy Q&A uh, 30 minutes, almost at an hour, um, <laughs> 30 minutes after the presentation. So Lynn? Hi, everybody. I'm Lynn Huckabee. Um, first, I'm just going to warn you that I'm a little under the weather, so my voice is a little rough, but I might be coughing. So uh, please bear with me. But um, I'm here to talk a little bit about what we've done in Massachusetts to um, encourage demand flexibility and to enable uh, buildings and other DERs on the grid um, through Mass Save Connected Solutions. So uh, next slide, please. So this is just generally about D, uh, DOER, which is a little bit of a filler, but uh, keep going. Okay, so in 2016, <laughs> DER commissions a study um, basically to understand um, our costs on the grid and, and kind of when they were most expensive. Um, we had been experiencing issues with peaks getting peakier. We were experiencing um, costs due to um, uh, really uh, intense weather situations. Um, we realized that we are starting to turn a corner in terms of an intermittent clean generation. Um, we knew that we didn't have access to AMI in the short term. Um, that is currently changing right now. Uh, but at the time, we, we knew that it was just not going to uh, be ready for us anytime soon. And um, we had a statute for energy efficiency that required the acquisition of all cost-effective energy efficiency and demand resources um, so we essentially had this sort of legislative hook that we could hang um, more aggressive active demand response on. Um, in energy efficiency, we've obviously been managing demand passively since um, the we started kind of in earnest in 1997. And um, so we had a lot of um, kind of the framework in place from that in order to kind of move forward. So next slide, please. <laughs> so this is, is um, I'm not going to kind of go through this, but in the study that we commissioned, we really were talking about how um, our uh, most of our costs were experienced in a very small number of hours and um, that we kind of needed to address that uh, first. The uh, ISO New England summer peak is the only value stream added, um, allowed for active demand in um, the energy efficiency programs. Um, we use the total resource cost test. And um, basically, because that is the only value of DER that has been quantified up to this point, and um, actually to Paul's point, we, uh, in for energy efficiency, we're using avoided costs and not uh, deferred cost of transmission. So it's really about um, what the avoided costs are under the TRC test. and. Uh, what we found is um, avoiding that peak was the only uh, real value that we were able to claim under energy efficiency, which was fine because it was really quite valuable. Uh, keep going. Next slide, thanks. Um, so we had the mechanism in place. Um, we had uh, a, a lot of brand recognition of the program. Uh, we knew that really thinking about how to uh, leverage DERs long-term was going to be a, a very different process, but there was gonna be a lot of uncertainty there, but we were able to really mobilize this one sort of regulatory mechanism quickly. So <clears throat> we required that our energy efficiency program managers um, do a pilot in the 2016 to 18 uh, plan. And um, we had, programs at scale for 2019 to 2021. The way that that works is that we have an Energy Efficiency Advisory Council that is chaired by DOER as the state uh, energy office, and they negotiate the terms, including how much performance incentive 
is available to the program administrators for um, doing their active demand reduction and that plan, including that uh, incentive structure is then uh, reviewed and approved by the DPU. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the connected solutions programs as they operate now are all performance-based. So there are no um, upfront incentives for, well, there, there are no upfront incentives for purchasing things like storage, but there um, are upfront incentives for things like thermostats or, or um, like smaller uh, connected devices. Um, that is really justified by the passive demand, the fact that, you know, using a uh, technology like Nest, you can, you can get a lot of passive demand that works well in um, energy efficiency, but the active demand program itself is all performance-based. So it's, it is only providing an incentive for um, the kilowatts saved at um, those very few hours during the year. So we have both commercial and residential programs. As a general rule, they are um, they are technology neutral. So um, the the one exception being that we don't allow fossil fuel generation in commercial um, programs to curtail load. Um, but they're generally technology neutral. The daily is only meant for storage, um, and for residential. There is a um, an aggregator um, that, like a curtailment services aggregator, that um, has a platform that has a data standard, and any vendor, like um, uh, um, an inverter vendor for storage, or a uh, Nest, or um, just anybody, would essentially have to figure out how to work with this um, data standard. I think that we're using Energy Hub right now. Um, so essentially, all of the kind of data uh, standardization questions really happen because there is a, um, a procured outsourced uh, manager that is um, creating the standard that people need to meet. So next slide. Um, so <laughs> in all the time that, that we've been doing this, we've, we've managed to make a pretty big program. Um, it's over 200 um, megawatts of um, of active demand reduction that is being controlled for uh, system peak right now. Um, and, you know, we're in the process of negotiating our next plan and, and hoping that we're going to get even more at that point. I think, um, actually, go up to the next slide and I'll kind of talk about some of the issues there. So, um, the one of the big issues, so DLC rolled out relatively smoothly. Um, one of the big issues that we're having right now is that we really do need to define our benefits more broadly until we can look at more benefits other than just that um, system peak. Um, we, we, I kind of like to liken it to um, we have access or, or that a diner menu is in front of us and we're only allowed to order off of the kids menu. Um, and clearly there are a lot of um, different value streams that are out there that we could be utilizing, that we could be kind of using our infrastructure for. We just don't really have the mechanism to do it. Um, I think a question that was asked before that that Paul was addressing <laughs> was about um, what, what do we need to do in order to kind of accelerate this? And I think that the real answer is to try and align the um, incentives for uh, active demand management um, with all the, the um, entities involved. Like obviously with the, the FERC order, we're going to be talking about how to um, make the incentives appropriate um, on the wholesale market. But I think that a lot of work needs to be done um, at the EDC level for um, creating an incentive for them to really start planning their distribution system with demand management as an uh, actual resource. So um, I think that that's kind of the, the big issue. The, a couple of other lessons that we learned include that um, for storage, at least, we had to require the um, five-year incentive lock. What we found is that the development timeline for particularly large commercial storage is really long and our energy efficiency plants are only three years long. 
worked. So they really needed more certainty that they were going to be able to um, get the promised incentive uh, in order to be able to finance the program. So um, the way that we did that is we got DPU approval to uh, provide a guarantee for the incentives for five years, even though the plan only lasts for three. Um, we talked a little bit about defining benefits more broadly. Um, I think that that is kind of the next really big step. I think it's sort of more of the strategic step more than the um, operational step. And we basically just need to find a way to make sure that the um, incentives are aligned to, to ensure that we are able to kind of look at that whole diner menu. Um, so incentives for installation. Um, as I said, the program is entirely performance-based and um, what we found is that um, it is not the most equitable program. We've um, faced a lot of pushback in the fact that we are not providing any upfront incentives, which means that um, lower income customers are um, basically not able to tap into all the other potential benefits of, for instance, storage. Um, so we're really thinking hard about how we can actually get batteries into um, lower income customers' hands and um, to essentially have them able to tap into those performance incentives that are available through connected solutions. Um, so <clears throat> I believe, it, uh, I think it was Rodney that asked the question in the Q&A about um, kind of coordination with the retail and wholesale pr uh, programs. And we're not really at that point yet because the way that uh, the avoided cost system works for the uh, energy efficiency program administrators is that because of their incentives as they operate in the wholesale market, they are able to pass that value onto their customers. So right now, because the, the um, value is relatively straightforward, it's, it's somewhat easy. However, we've run into issues with um, basically uh, energy efficiency evaluation. And um, when you think about the sort of traditional energy efficiency evaluation framework of what is the actual impact of this dollar that we've spent, we have been running into issues in um, as other uh, programs start to come online, um, most acutely with our uh, Clean Peak program. So um, we have resources that want to participate in both Clean Peak and Connected Solutions. And in the tr traditional energy efficiency evaluation framework, um, the savings in energy efficiency is eroded by performance in um, the capacity market, or excuse me, the uh, Clean Peak market. So um, that is going to require some thought about how we really look at um, energy efficiency dollars moving forward, and and particularly when, as a policy perspective, you really want there to be a value stack that's going to to kind of allow you to to really procure a lot. Because um, right now, um, we've essentially kind of had to to sort of um, say that that we're we're just going to sort of accept it until we we find a better way to really treat it. And um, we're trying to think about that as we um, do our new um, three-year plan that is the first draft of the plan is gonna be released in April of 2024 and it will be for 25 through seven. So that is a very active conversation that's happening right now. Um, so the one other issue that we found <laughs> is that the restriction of energy efficiency really means that the, the end goal is to reduce the load at that particular site. And what we found is that because Connected Solutions is successful, it's lucrative, um, that we found developers wanting to essentially put grid scale batteries behind the meter to get the Connected Solutions incentives. And um, we've essentially said that that's not possible. And so now what we're seeing is that uh, the Clean Peak standard <laughs> is less lucrative than connected solutions. So we essentially kind of have a gap. We have um, 
an incentive behind the meter. We have a less lucrative incentive incentive in front of the meter, and we have developers that really want to see the kinds of incentives that we're offering behind the meter applied in front of the, the meter. So most of the um, behind the meter storage that's going in right now is smaller than I think the, in, the market would like it to be because of that limitation. Um, <laughs> so um, next slide. So obviously moving forward, we need to think about the fact that we're increasing load, um, that we're increasing intermittent generation. Um, obviously that we wanna increase climate resilience. Um, we are also um, looking at AMI and uh, subsequently uh, time varying rates coming in the next uh, like three or four years. And we also need to find a way to kind of better integrate um, connected solutions as it exists right now with our other de demand management policies and really just start thinking about it a little bit more strategically. I think that um, from the story of, of how it evolved, it was sort of a reaction and we need to start thinking about it a little bit more proactively. So I think that that is pretty much it for me in the uh, slides that are gonna go out. There's a, an appendix that gives more kind of detailed information about the uh, program parameters. So feel free to look at it and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lynn. And thank you for um, uh, joining despite not feeling well. I know how tough that is. Um, let's move to our mm -hmm. second uh, panelist. Uh, and then just a reminder, folks can keep um, putting questions in the chat. Uh, Vince? Thanks very much, Chair Glad. Um, my name is Vince Faraday. I'm with the Google Nest uh, Energy Partnerships team. Uh, I'm based outside Boston, and like Lynn, uh, I have the same cold that everybody in New England seems to have right now, so my voice is a little bit in between. But um, it's really great to be with you all today. really appreciate the invitation to this, uh, this, incredible, this incredible webinar in this series kicking off, uh, and I'm really excited to share um, some perspectives from Nest and what we're, what we're building with our partners throughout the industry today with uh, virtual power plants. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to anchor us a little bit on Nest. Um, yeah, this is great. Um, and, and But I'm going to mostly talk more broadly about the smart thermostat uh, industry as a whole and what we've been building related to, to flexible load and, and, and virtual power plants. Um, just brief, briefly on me, I've been with the company about seven years. Prior to this, I was with a company called Enernoc that um, was the precursor to, to today's NLX, um, building demand response resources. And on the TNI side then and today, um, really tremendous amount of load that we're building in the residential side. And a lot of that is down to these smart thermostats um, that have been tremendously successful over, over the past decade or so, um, though by no means saturation. That's something I wanted to, to start with today that um, I hope many of you have smart thermostats in, in your homes. Um, they're a wonderful way to save money, to reduce your energy usage. Um, they in our case with Nest thermostats, they provide about, call it 10 to 15% savings on heating and cooling. Uh, and then when connected to the internet and connected to a demand response program or a virtual power plant, they also can provide about a kilowatt of demand roughly, depending on the, the, the climate zone um, that can be enrolled and, 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 and built into virtual power plants and demand response resources. All that being said, and the tremendous growth that we've had over the last decade, we're still uh, very early in this story. So there's a, a couple different sources, including the DOE, the EIA, Parts Associates, they all arrive at about the same number that we're only about 20% of US households have any kind of smart thermostat today. So put differently, you know, eight and 10 households don't have any kind of connected uh, connected device to probably their, their the biggest load source in their home, which is their heating and cooling. So tremendous uh, opportunity and challenge yet, yet ahead of us as an industry. Go to the next slide, please. Well, that being said, we, we still have, um, built uh, quite a large virtual power plant um, across the industry today. And so smart thermostat demand really, uh, demand response is proven at scale today. Um, just speaking for Nest for this moment, we, we work with uh, about 100, more than 100 programs in 36 states uh, across the country. Um, we have over a gigawatt of load under management. And then when we're, we're a piece of the, of the industry, when you zoom out to other manufacturers and other load sources, the, the entire smart thermostat demand response residential space is, is much larger. Um, again, tremendous work that's being done today, including connected solutions. We work very closely in Massachusetts with, with, um, with, with the utilities there. 
um, but still a lot to be done and, and a lot of growth here. Um, next slide, please. We've certainly pivoted as, as an industry, I think, to talk about VPPs. Uh, and I just want to give um, full credit to the leadership of the DOE here, Vigor Shaw and Jen Downing in particular. Um, Paul referenced the VPP liftoff report that that the group put out earlier in this year. If you have if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend you you, you take a look. It really has given us really a true north um, for our industry because the need for VPPs is truly massive. When you and this is a, a simple uh, visual from that report, um, as you think about the current state of, of of VPPs today, and then you think of what's going to be planned for retirements and then the the, the kind of delta of needs. We're going to need about 80 to 160 gigawatts of new VPPs by 2030. That's 3xing the what we have currently in the market. Um, so tremendous possibilities and, and a tremendous need that um, that our industry certainly is is aligning around how we can help grow. Next slide, please. And I think another piece of good news here towards that true north of where we need to get is that VPPs, from our perspective, are the cheapest source to maintain a reliable grid. This is a visual from a report that the Brattle Group uh, uh, concluded earlier this year. There's a link here if you haven't seen it. It's called Real Reliability, the, the Value of Virtual Power. And what they did here was they compared three different types of resources for resource adequacy, uh, a kind of traditional gas peaker, a grid-connected battery, and then a virtual power plant that, that comprised of some smart thermostats, but also behind the meter load sources like EVs and smart water heaters. And what they found really was that uh, that that when you when you take into uh, take into account the costs of all those, the VPP can provide the same resource adequacy. In this case, it was measuring 400 megawatts of resource adequacy, the same resource adequacy for dramatically reduced costs, 40 to 60 percent of the overall costs. And that was even before they had layered in the potential benefits that would be provided when you had a VPP. So things like emissions, resilience, distributions, transmission, insulation services, et cetera. Um, this is again, I think an important data point for the industry where I think there are misperceptions that VPPs are more expensive or less reliable. When you think of them as, um, I think you related to resource adequacy, we really have a tremendous opportunity to, to help attack that need that the DOE has identified with really cost-effective uh, and cheap resources here. Next slide, please. And then kind of rounding this out. So there's a need, it's it's cheap. Customers want to participate. This is a, a little snapshot of some Nest survey data that we've heard, that we've seen over the years with what we call Rush Hour Rewards. That's the, just the consumer facing brand of the demand response resource that plugs into the connected solutions program that Lynn mentioned, for example. But we actually see a higher net promoter score for customers that are that are in these programs. There's, there's kind of a, a classic question that we get of, are, do people actually want to participate in these resources? Our answer is emphatically that they do. They We, we think that they actually find value in this. They're certainly getting getting compensated for their participation. Uh, and they also like to participate when they're feeling like their, their smart thermostat is actually helping to contribute to something to their, to their grid, whether that's for climate reasons or resiliency or saving money. There's a, there's a lot of uh, reasons that customers participate and, and they're happy to. Next slide, please. With all that in mind and all the, the tailwinds we're facing, it's something that we, we are also working against really is that most smart thermosets today are not VPP ready. Um, more than two thirds of the market today can't support the type of demand response that I just described. This is some sample data from what was called the BSRIA uh, survey of residential smart, uh, residential thermostats. And the key, the key f factor here is that if you look at what's in green, the smart category, that would be thermostats that can be connected to the internet that could also be connected to a grid service program like demand response. Um, they're only about a third of the market. So these are the, the red there is the kind of traditional program rules that are not grid connected, not Wi-Fi enabled or manual thermostats. And this is 2021 data. So for, there is a tremendous amount of thermostats that are still getting deployed in the market today. And in some cases, even incentivized in, in, in utility programs that really have no hope of ever being connected to the grid services programs that we know matter the most for, for reliability and, and, and for where we need to get to as a country. Um, so there's tremendous, again, possibilities here, but also some headwinds that we're trying to face to, to evangelize that um, more smart thermostats should be connected to, to grid programs. Next slide, please. And that's certainly more more pronounced than ever with with the IRA. There's obviously a tremendous amount of incredible work that's been that, that's going on currently with with the IRA and rollout, particularly at state energy offices. Um, smart thermostats are an eligible measure under the IRA, um, but 
a piece of feedback or recommendation that we would offer to anybody from state energy offices here is that as we are doing all this incredible outreach to customers to to uh, to de deploy heat pumps, I think we should make sure that those heat pumps are, are enabled to be connected to these grid service programs that we're also building simultaneously. So consider requiring some sort of smart thermostat, anything with Energy Star certification would work um, with heat pump insulation as we think to, to braid these two types of of, of both resources and also programmatic models into the future. Next slide, please. I'm going to finish here with two case studies of how of, of examples of utilities and partnerships that we've built uh, over the past couple of years that we think have been really successful that I'd like to share with you. Um, one is in Arizona. Um, both of these case studies, I will say, are about how do we increase access and equity to smart technologies like smart thermostats that can help customers and also help the grid. Um, Arizona obviously is in, has incredibly hot summers. Um, there's a there are very robust demand response programs that that exist currently with all the major utilities in Arizona, including APS, SRP, TEP. Um, what we were able to do this past summer was working in close coordination with them and with Energy Hub, which is our partner as the the aggregator of the Derms, who manages all the different demand response programs for those utilities. We were able to, to make an investment in bringing down the cost of Nest thermostats so that they could be deployed essentially free to customers when they enrolled in these good service programs and the demand response program, um, reducing barriers to, to, to enrollment and increasing the awareness that we know is, is crucial to, to growing these programs. Um, this is an example of, I think, statewide efforts that we're doing that are helping to, to increase awareness and then drive adoption in, in a really successful way. And also trying to engage different types of customers who um, with, with a really compelling offer really for either very little money or no money at all to make sure that we're having the widest reach possible. And if you go to the next slide, that, that theme of increasing access and equity endures here. Uh, another partnership that we embarked on this year with Consumers Energy, the utility in Michigan, um, that had a focus uh, at, at exactly this time last year as they were looking into the winter season and facing um, kind of an unprecedented rise in, in bills that they were, that they were for Casting. Um, we were able to put together a partnership with, with them and with Uplight, who manage both their, their demand response good service programs and also their online storefront or online marketplace to provide uh, no at zero cost, focus on what they call the, uh, their, their customers that were in the Alice category. So asset limited, income, income, income constrained, employed. Uh, and we were able to, to offer a free Nest thermostat. Um, to customers all over Michigan, we were able to connect devices to 37,000 households, um, which creates the potential for them to be enrolled in demand response programs, um, bringing value both to those households that were then adding um, more money in pockets and also providing a new resource to the grid. So I think, and I'll, I'll finish with this, and I'm happy to go to your questions. There's a, there's a ton that's happening at the moment, which is really, really amazing across the industry. We've certainly... Um, there's certainly still quite a lot to do. And I think at the nexus of these partnerships of, of the public sector, of utilities, of technology providers of ourselves, that there's a lot that we can do to raise awareness uh, and, and build new grid resources. I think that's it for me. I'll pause and see, and maybe hand it back to Chair, Chair Gillette. Thank you so much, Vince. Uh, so with um, the time remaining, I'm gonna throw out some questions. Uh, we have Vince, Lynn, and Paul from earlier. And I'm going to start with a question um, that Vince actually already touched on uh, in, in the course of his presentation. Um, but selfishly, as a regulator, I'm always looking for ideas um, about priority actions or other things that I can take um, to enable the proliferation, uh, and in this context, the proliferation of aggregated DER grid services. So Vince mentioned something that a state energy office could do. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to throw out the question to the group. Um, and since Vince already provided one, I'll, I'll let him go last so he can think of a second one because he's not off the hook here. Um, so uh, let me go to Paul, Lynn, and Vince, each for your thoughts on either something a regulator can do or a state energy office can do or both. Paul? Yeah, I think um, as it's been touched on um, by both um, Vince and Lynn, um, utilizing programs to or reorienting programs towards these needs, I think, are uh, is is a really important step. I mean, clearly getting uh, tariff designs, um, you know, aligned to what the objectives are for uh, trying to meet the needs uh, that that are being identified in the planning process is important. But 
you know, which, which is basically no incremental cost to rate payers in effect. Um, programs to the extent that they're using a public goods charge that may already be paid by uh, consumers uh, is an effective next step because it's no incremental cost to consumers. And to the extent that you can realign some of those programs to address these needs um, is a really an effective step to move forward. I think Lynn touched on this, some of the programs that Vince touched on go to this as well. When we get to end up get to procurements, those are clearly incremental costs to rate pairs. Um, and so when we think about these, you know, the three P's, pricing programs and procurement, I would definitely try to, you know, try and see what you could do with pricing and programs uh, before you move to procurement um, and see, and because programs can really be effective in thinking about how to, how to take advantage of the comparative advantage that various entities, including the utility may have to be able to have a low cost solution uh, to address, um, you know, the objectives that you're trying to do, particularly as you scale up. So I, I have two thoughts. Um, the first being that, um, so energy efficiency is, you know, there's a, a performance incentive for it, but generally the, the idea is that you create a, a kind of top line goal for, for management. But I think that, um, the idea of demand resources really needs to be integrated into system planning. Um, and, and there really needs to be a way to, to monetize demand reductions within system planning and to have it be part of the conversation. Um, right now, energy efficiency is less lucrative to um, distribution companies than um, actually like putting in infrastructure. We need to find a way to really align um, the incentives to, to make sure that they have a, a, a reason to decrease their um, distribution system load. And I would add um, that I think partnerships are crucial to how we can engage more customers on, on all these, these types of programs and services that matter the most. And, and I, would, I would encourage everyone to think about while we might think of IRA or resiliency or utility programs or demand response programs kind of separately or in silos from a customer's perspective, they're thinking of it in terms of a new smart thermostat or a, uh, a, I'm thinking about going to solar, or maybe I'm gonna get an EV. Um, and I think now more than ever, there are, there's, there are funding available, there's willing partnerships from the private and public sector available to grade a lot of these this value together to, to solve the question that, that, have, that have dogged us for years, which is, are these affordable? Can we actually, can we make this affordable for customers? I think there's, there, there's ample money that's available now if we can connect it in the right way and engage people in the right way um, around, around things that matter to them and also matter to, to what we're trying to do as a country. Thank you. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to braid my daughter's hair. So I will leave it to others to figure out how to braid um, funding. Uh, but let me stick with you, Vince, for a second. Um, uh, there to pick up on a question that I posed to Paul earlier, um, and uh, he had the overview of grid services um, during his presentation, wondering if we can pivot um, more to the context that you provided on smart thermostats and talk about some of the grid services that smart thermostats have been able to provide, because I think it's a nice lead into the next question I want to pose to the group here. Yeah, sure. So um, the for the end user, this is doing the same thing. It's 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 toggling um, heating and cooling in one time. Um, we are providing now via our our partners, and we would call those the, the Derms platform. Lynn mentioned Energy Hub as as, as managing the program in Massachusetts. Certainly, um, th those resources are now I think being used for a myriad of, of of grid services. And I think Paul, you you had pointed out there's that the transition chart from ten years ago. Man response was simply an emergency resource, kind of an on-off button or an industrial facility turning on its backup generator. It has certainly gotten faster. We've gotten more nimble. And I think what, uh, in terms of dispatch and response time, which I think has been able, our, we, we've been able to, to enable partners like Energy Hub or, or, or others to, to, to do things like uh, non-wires alternatives or to do kind of quicker response. And where I think the industry is going certainly is more continuous optimization, more orchestration. Um, smaller tweaks that can then be used even even quicker um, to help to help unlock more of those good services. 
Thank you. And and maybe um, uh, to, to Paul and, and the panel um, more broadly. So on the, on the flip side of the equation, we spent a little bit talking about um, what uh, aggregated DER can do, you know, for us. Um, but on the other side of the equation, uh, what should we be doing for AD, aggregated DER um, from this uh, perspective of, you know, trust is key in these markets. So what specifically needs to be in place um, uh, to ensure that they are trusted partners and um, that they're going to receive um, compensation for the benefits they're providing. Any any thoughts on what needs to be in place here, Paul? Well, yeah, so uh, I think it's a good question on the trust. And I think um, some of the trust has to do with um, sort of this risk question, the risk management that I mentioned. You know, traditionally, operators may have been somewhat skeptical of the performance that the aggregated DER might provide. Part of that is education. Part of that is helping people understand what Finch just described in terms of where the state of the art is in terms of what technology can do. And we, we've clearly moved away, as Finn said, from just these binary once once every so often turning something on up to now, what's possible is, as was touched on is continuous harvesting, if you will. So it's not really disruptive to customers, but yet you can aggregate some meaningful load um, that uh, on, on the net load side uh, that can really be used um, pretty effectively for longer durations in aggregation for uh, grid um, services that typically need long, longer duration kind of response times. Um, the wholesale market may only need things on an hourly basis or two hour. When we start moving into grid, we need longer duration. So how do we think about what individual technologies can provide or combinations? And that's going to take some work to really get people to, to understand how these can be combined uh, to provide the kind of uh, resource capability that's needed. I think the other question that comes up is we haven't really discussed this, and this was one of the limitations with non-Mars alternatives. There were two two problems. One is we weren't using the full value that might be provided. That is, there was societal value that might accrue, but that doesn't flow through the utility. And so when you're comparing apples to apples in terms of cost offset, some of that um, wasn't necessarily being reflected. And so we need to think differently about how value and the cost effectiveness might be. The other is we didn't really include reserve margins. So the equivalent of that. So how might we need to think about what may need to be sourced to be able to address, like we do in the wholesale market, maybe we need to um, source additional amount to make sure that you can meet the objective that you're trying to solve for, because it's pretty clear we're not gonna be able to do this and then still be cost effective to the points that Vince is making and, and Lynn made. Um, but I think we need to think about that differently because we're not gonna get there under the old paradigm, you know, and particularly if we're gonna have to looking at avoiding uh, you know, distribution costs. It's pretty clear, I think, to most people, there's no way we're going to afford um, to build out under a traditional model to, to meet a 40% increase in load in the U.S. The distribution costs alone are prohibitive. We've got supply chain issues. We've got all kinds of issues. This is not going to happen. So we, we've got to figure out how to leverage distributed resources. And that's going to take a little different thinking. Learn from, learn from the recent past, but how we might adapt and move forward. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, anything to add here? So um, I, I totally take po uh, Paul's point about um, the fact that we really only have a lot of experience with short duration um, events, but in the case of short duration events, Massachusetts is currently bidding their active demand reduction assets into the ISO New England forward capacity market. They have been doing it for um, six, almost six years now. Um, so this, in terms of, of trust, it's there, it, it has performed. Um, so, you know, happy to talk to anybody who has questions on kind of methodology, but um, it, it is a proven resource, at least in the short term. That's great, thank you. And Vince, I'll give you the last word here um, before we transition to next steps. Uh, now, just plus one to everything that, that that was said. I mean, I think that we, um, like Lynn said, we, we see this as a proven resource that is certainly grid connected in, in Massachusetts and other places as well. Um, the customer interest is there, and I think it, it's up to us to to work together to to braid those funds, to to increase awareness, uh, to to enroll more people in these programs and to grow these these good services.
All right, thank you. Well, I'm um, I'm sure uh, all the panelists, um, sorry, attendees would join me in uh, thanking each of you for your uh, presentations and uh, answering our questions this afternoon. And I am going to turn it back to um, our hosts, uh, Danielle and Kirsten from um, Nehru Gymnasio uh, for their reflections. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Gillette, and thank you so much to the panelists for um, an amazing kickoff to, to this um, module. Um, I'm really excited what we heard today, and I think um, one of my biggest takeaways is just the incredible um, amount of um, things we still have to do, um, as well as how much Nazi and Niruk um, can, can, can contribute to this. Um, I also think my biggest takeaway was just um, kind of the coordination role that the states and the state members um, will, will take as You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, as we're trying to, um, uh, as we're trying to evaluate how these technologies, what kind of role the technologies play on the grid, and how we can kind of, um, you know, weave some of these plans and and policies and programs that all of our members are putting forward. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Danielle. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you again to all of our expert speakers. Your insights were really valuable, and I'm sure are helping a lot of our members think about these questions and challenges in different ways and come up with some new ideas how they can apply some of the lessons learned in their own states. I'll just take this um, moment to transition to what's coming up next. Um, as noted earlier in the webinar, we've got two more opportunities for you to get some of this kind of concrete, practical, and foundational information on aggregated DER valuation on December 18th and then on compensation options on January 8th. And that's really just the beginning. Um, this is our kickoff relaunch of a webinar series. <clears throat> but over the course of 2024, we will be offering many other opportunities for engagement, developing a series of resources that we anticipate will be very actionable and practical and allow members on both sides to be able to uh, advance DERs to the benefit of customers and um, utilities and businesses in their states. So please watch our website. Uh, Kara put the link in the chat again for additional opportunities to register for future events and resources. And please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, um, Kirsten, Catherine, Jeff, or myself, if we can be assistant of any assistance and get you more closely involved in some of the peer sharing activities to come. Thank you all again. And as noted in the chat, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted to that website as well. So we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.